Good morning and welcome to the World Challenge Chapel. For everyone watching online or on YouTube, thank you so much for being with us. If you'll get your Bible out and turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Today we're going to deal with verses 1 through 23, but I'm going to read the first nine verses at the beginning of the sermon, and then together we'll work through the remainder of the verses as the sermon proceeds. This message is titled, The Tell of Four Soils. Matthew 13, 1 says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they immediately sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. Since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray as your word is proclaimed in this place today, God, that it would be like good seed. And God, that it would fall on good soil. Even now, God, I pray that you would till the soil of our hearts, God. Give us soft, broken hearts to receive your word so that we might not merely be hearers of the word, but God, that by your power, we might be doers of the word. So Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see and and a mind to perceive the truth of the kingdom of God, Lord, as given to us by the Savior. Lord, I pray that your spirit would do something miraculous in this place. And Lord, that it would would be for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we're dealing with a parable that Jesus spoke and explained in succession. It's a very important parable because within this parable, Jesus not only explains or interprets the parable, but he tells us why he taught in parables. That's why very often when someone does a series on the parables, they will start with this one because it tells us why from the Old Testament, but also from Jesus's heart, why he taught in parables. But it's also important to mention that Matthew 13 also contains deep foundational truths about the kingdom of God itself and the very substance of the gospel. So very often in our day and age, people like to emphasize what they are passionate about and they, 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 they call what they're passionate about foundational and paramount. They say that this isn't the most important issue in Christianity or they want to elevate what they're talking about, even if it is important by saying this is a kingdom issue or this is a gospel issue when in fact it might not be true. If everything is the most important thing, then nothing is the most important thing. During Jesus's earthly ministry, as well as today, so often we find practical application of Jesus's teaching in a way where it's like the fruit is being severed from the tree. There are aspects of Jesus's teachings that we like to focus on in our culture or in particular churches. But if we disconnect the fruit from the substance of the tree, and what I'm talking about here is the fact that this is talking about the very kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So often people like to make the gospel a side issue where in the New Testament, it is the paramount issue, the gospel of grace, the salvation of sinners and God drawing people to himself is a major and foundational theme throughout the whole Bible. But it is a very important and very apparent theme in the teachings of Jesus. 
while it's true that we can find practical, spiritual kingdom implications from the truth of Christ that he taught us, if we do so in a way that diminishes, minimizes, or ignores the governing context of what Jesus's main message was, we do very great damage to the text. And we really sort of isolate out the true point that Jesus is making regarding his kingdom and the gospel implications of his ministry. Stanley Tosaint, a theologian once said, not seeing the messiahship of Jesus in his words and his works, they separated the fruit from the tree. And this is what he's pointing out in his New Testament commentary about the hearers of Jesus's age, the people in the first century. There are many people who followed Jesus for many different reasons. Very often they, they wanted to see the guy that made the bread or the guy that did the miracles, or they wanted to be part of, of being a witness to this guy that seemed to be in conflict with the Pharisees. But the truth is Jesus was always drawing a line in the sand. His mere presence and existence draws a line in the sand. There will be people who will be saved into the kingdom of God. Our ears should perk up when we hear the words, and so these will inherit the kingdom of God, or such is the kingdom of heaven. The people who witnessed the words and the works of Jesus in the first century, they didn't deny his miracles. And many, if not most of them, acknowledged on some level that they were performed by God's power. They just couldn't accept that Jesus himself was the Messiah and that he himself was in fact God. And this is the most important thing. If you acknowledge that Jesus was a kind person or a good teacher or a miracle worker or whatever else, but you don't call him and respond to him as if he is God, then you miss the entire point. The parable of the sower is called the parable, uh, the, most people call it the parable of the sower. I like to call it the tale of four souls, soils, because the soil is the most important part of the parable. The, the seed is important. The sower is important. But what really determines the outcome is the condition of the soil. And this this parable is found in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's very important. We hear this story three times in a row if you're reading through the New Testament. Jesus ends his parable by saying, those who have ears, let them hear. So we must acknowledge that this is something very foundational, something very paramount, something very, very important. What's interesting about this parable is that Jesus gives it openly for everyone to hear. But then later when his disciples come to him in private and they ask him what it meant and for him to explain it to them, he does. This parable really serves as an example of how we should view all the parables of Jesus. They were meant for the hearing of all, but the meaning, listen, the secrets of the kingdom of God, the truth of the kingdom of God is only for those who God reveals himself to, for those who are followers and disciples of Jesus. The truth is plain to see. The truth is, is easy to understand, but it's not easy to accept. And that's what we deal with in the teachings of Jesus. It's very interesting to note that there are 46 parables in the first three gospels. But in the gospel of John, there are no parables. It's void of parables. John instead uses allegory. This makes John a very distinct gospel and a very important narrative, but it's also much, much different. In John's gospel, he only mentions seven of Jesus's miracles that he uses as signs or signposts to point to Christ. We also know that John was written later 
than the three synoptic gospels. So John didn't repeat many of the things that had already been said. Although the focus of many of the parables are quite different, the overarching theme of them are plainly and always gospel centric. Nothing unnerves me more to listen to preachers dissect a gospel or dissect a parable down to find some principle that they want to emphasize that, it, that actually is sort of in contrast to the actual meaning of the parable. They focus on one little detail to make their point. This is very damaging. This is taking Jesus out of context. The parables are kingdom centered. They are gospel centered. Several of the, the parables Jesus gives are about the coming kingdom of the Lord and making yourself ready for his appearing. The judgment of God, the judgment on those who reject God, the judgment of all humanity who will one day stand before the living God. Many of the parables focus on distinguishing between who are the true children of God and who are false children of God. True converts and faults. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not only the overarching theme of the gospels and the New Testament, but in fact of the entire Bible. The person of Jesus, his gospel, and his kingdom will be the ultimate dividing line of all history and human existence. This is the answer to all questions. Jesus is the answer to all things because Jesus is the origin of all things. That's why John starts his gospel by saying in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He makes great pains for us to understand that this living word made flesh, the person of Jesus was in the creation narrative and nothing was made that wasn't made through him. And then in fact, that he is the light and the life of the world and in him, listen, is life and light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot and it will not overcome it. The most important question that the parables of Jesus pose is where will you spend eternity? And what do you make of this man, Jesus? The most important question answered in the entirety of the New Testament, in the entirety of the Bible, the most important question you will ever answer and that I will ever answer is this. Not who do men say I am. Not who does history say I am. Not who do the kingdoms of this world say that I am. Not even what does or who does religion say I am. The most important question I will ever answer and you will ever answer is this. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? because a mere acknowledgement of who he is, is not enough. Listen, even the demons know who Jesus is and they acknowledge it. It says, in fact, they, they tremble and they shudder at his name. Who is Jesus to you? This is the most important question. The answer is he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. He is the only way to God. There is no other way to God than Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I pray that as we go through this, you pay very close attention as we humbly study the words of the Savior himself. One other important point we need to make about his parables is this. Many modern teachers will want you to believe that they have special insight into the Bible that's not available to you or some sort of secret knowledge because they are an anointed teacher and you are a mere person. We are mere peasants in their sight. And they will attempt to tell you that in fact, there are two gospels. There is a gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of salvation. The reason they want to tell you that and separate these two things from each other 
is so that they can tell you that the gospel of the kingdom is about living your best life now rather than living a, a life in subjection to Christ as our king. They want to disjoint the gospel from what they call the gospel of the kingdom or kingdom secrets or kingdom principles. And they want to do this to convince you of one very dangerous deception. It's simple and it's small, but it's dangerous. And that is that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is more about the here and now than it is about the life to come. The kingdom of God, listen, is here. The kingdom of God has come, but the kingdom of God is still coming. It hasn't come in its fullness, just like salvation. The day you call upon the name of the Lord and you are truly saved, that day you are saved. And through the course of your life, you are being saved. And one day when you arrive in heaven, you will ultimately be saved. And that is the same truth of the kingdom of God. Let's get to the text. Verse one, it says that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach. Now the phrase that same day links this account to the previous story where Jesus had told uh, the people that were around him that his disciples were his true mother and brother and sisters. It's letting us know that, that this is not some future event. It happened that same day. And then to verse three, it says, and then he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up. Since they had no depth of soil, the sun rose and they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. And so Jesus goes out and, and stands on the beach and sits beside the sea and a crowd swarms him. And so what he does is he gets into a boat so he can create a little safety and separation so that he could teach them. And as they stood there, it says he told them many things in parables. And he starts with the parable of the sower, or as I like to call it, the parable of the four soils. And he gives this description in this parable. He goes on in verse 10, it says, the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak in parables? And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. So Jesus says, listen, while I'm plainly proclaiming the truth to these people, it is not for them to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. It's for you. It's for my true disciples. It's for people spirit, whose spiritual eyes have been opened, who have ears to hear, who have a heart to receive. People who have the right heart posture, people who are truly following me for the right reasons. These secrets are made for you. So the plain teaching really is given as a proclamation to the people. And on judgment day will be an indictment to those people. But the secrets of those, uh, of those parables are given to you. And Jesus is about to explain to them why from the Old Testament. But he says they, 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 can, they can see, but they actually can't see. And even though they hear the parable, they won't understand. They can't perceive it. Their hearts aren't soft and he's about to break the parable down and tell them why. 
He goes on in verse 14 and says, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull and their ears can barely hear and their eyes have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Jesus is saying, I am the answer to prophecy. I am the long awaited Messiah. I am the God who took on flesh. And the truth is, is even the religious people who are pretending like they follow God, they're not really my followers. See, there's always been a remnant of faithful people who knew and feared the Lord. He says, those prophets who prophesied about me, those, those patriarchs who were men of faith of old, listen, they long to see this day. They wished that they were here, that they could actually see God take on flesh and the kingdom of, the, the kingdom of God come. These other people, they're not really interested in the kingdom of God, but you are. And so you have ears to hear, you have eyes to see. You've got a heart that can understand and perceive. And I'm about to explain to you why by interpreting the parable Jesus tells them. Let's get into the parable. We have many modern techniques for farming today. So it's sometimes hard to understand the, the, the farming language of the Bible because we do things in mass production. We have huge breakthroughs that have made where we can farm large swath of land with, with machines and automation and all of these things. There have been so many breakthroughs in agricultural science in the last 2000 years. So it's important that we put farming in a first century context. Farming in the first century was a crucial part of life. And this parable would have made very plain sense and made a very clear point to the people of Jesus's day. Number one, we're talking about the seed of God's word. In the first century, the farmer would typically have sown the seed by what's called broadcast sowing. So the, the, the farmer would have the ground already would be tilled and, and ready to receive the seed. And they would put the seed in a satchel and they would walk along the lines in, in the land and they would take handfuls of seed and they would just broadcast, spread it out as they walked, not paying great attention to where it landed, just trying to make a large swath of seed just, be, just go in front of them as they walked. This was called broadcast sowing. He would carry his satchel across his soldier, his shoulder. He would grab handfuls of seed and he would spread it as he walked down the field in straight lines, trying to ensure that he got as much seed spread in, as in, in many places as possible. This was the goal. He wanted to spread as much seed as broadly and as widely across the field as he could. The seed in the parable is the word of God. Notice there isn't a lot of emphasis on sowing techniques. If you got the right seed and you're throwing it into the soil, you're doing it right. In our context, if we preach the word of God without distorting it or trying to manipulate it, you are casting seed. We cast seed from pulpits. We cast seeds in interactions with people at our job. We cast seed in any place we can, spreading it as wide and as broad as we can, hoping the seed will fall on good ground. We must do our best to simply preach the scripture in context under the power and the anointing and the illumination of the Holy Spirit. When we distort the plain teaching of the scripture, we are no longer throwing the seed that contains life. We are doing the devil's job for him. 
We are to share and preach the word simply and honestly with reverence and care. Listen, the seed in the parable is the same in all four instances. The seed that fell on the path, the seed that fell on the rocky soil, the seed that fell on the thorny soil, the seed that fell on the good soil, it's the same seed. What makes the difference in every case? It's the soil that it falls on. As preachers of the gospel, we simply throw seed. If we are simply and proclaiming, if we are simply and clearly proclaiming God's word, the only thing that really matters, and this is what we actually have no control over, is the kind of soil that it falls on. Number two, let's talk about the lost seed on the path. Verse 18 and 19, it says, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So the disciples are asking Jesus, please explain to us, not only why do you speak in parables, but what is the meaning of this parable? And Jesus says, because this is for your ears, because you are truly my disciples, because you cared enough to actually come with an open heart and ask me, what are you saying, Lord? I'm going to explain it to you. So the word of God is the seed. And then the first soil that we see is the hard soil, the, the soil that, that was sown along the path. We must preach the Bible in context and with sound interpretation. But even with that, no matter how good of a preacher you are, no matter how good of a Bible teacher you are, no matter how good of a witness you are, we cannot make God's word penetrate a hard heart. This is not the work of a preacher. We can't do the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't make people hear. We can't make people have ears that they might hear. We can't make blind eyes open. That's God's job. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. The path is where people walk around on the outskirts of the field. And when dirt gets walked on over and over and over again, it gets hard, it gets packed down. And there's no way for seed to infiltrate that kind of soil. Here's a principle we can draw from that. The longer you live in sin and outside of Christ, the longer you ignore the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the more you resist God's word, the more you harden yourself towards God, the harder your heart will get. Even when the truth of God is right there, you won't be able to accept it. And then the devil comes and brings doubt and snatches away the seed. Why do you think opposition to true biblical teaching is always present? I had a person on Facebook one time, I posted a scripture from Isaiah that said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. And he goes on my post and he says, your tone is harsh. You're a judgmental person. And I asked him, how is the tone harsh? I just quoted a scripture. And there are some people that hear the truth and to them, the truth sounds like hate, why? Because they hate the truth. People don't wanna hear about the biblical Jesus. That's why our culture's invented a Jesus that will conform to your image. He will give you, he'll be the kind of savior you want him to be. He'll let you live the, the kind of life you wanna live. No conviction, no change, no problem, whatever you want. But that's not the real Jesus, that's the devil. The more packed down, the harder your heart is, the harder it will be for seed to find place to take root. The reason opposition to true biblical teaching is always present is because the devil knows it's the only thing that can change the life and heart of someone. Why is the truth always framed as hate? 
This is why churches pastored by false teachers are growing and overflowing. And they say, hey, look what the Lord has done. We don't preach that sort of stuff. We don't say repent. We don't, we don't say the harsh things people don't want to hear. We draw them in by telling them the things they do want to hear. And you're helping pack that soil down ever harder. The more packed down, the more hard your heart is, the more breaking up the ground will be hard and painful. But the Spirit of God can still till the hardest ground in a moment. The power of the Spirit of God can break your heart, can break through the hardest soil. I had hardened my heart to God's word. I'd heard it so much in my life, I didn't want it. But God used suffering and God used addiction and God used every means possible to humble me because I wasn't humble. And he broke my heart. And eventually that seed hit the good soil. It took root and it changed my life forever. Hear this. In the beginning, coming to Christ is a lot more about breaking hard ground And it's a lot more about subtraction than it is about addition. God has to break us and God has to take some stuff away before he adds to our life. Here's something I always used to say when I pastored at Teen Challenge. God is not going to build a mansion on a bad foundation and around the shack of sin that you want to keep. In the beginning, he's going to break up that bad foundation. He's going to break down and throw away that shack. He's going to lay a firm foundation and he's going to build a life on his word. Listen, that will not waver when the winds and the waves and the storms come. And it can be painful and hard as God breaks us and removes things from our lives. But he is subtracting from your life so that he can add good things, pure things, eternal things. Number three, the rocky soil. Verse 20 and 21, it says, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Oh, brothers and sisters, so many people in our culture are rocky soil Christians, false converts who who gladly receive the parts of God's word they like, or they say, God, I'll follow you. I'll go wherever you tell me to go. And he says, wait a second. Just remember the king, the, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, I'll follow you, Jesus, but golly, I've got to go bury my father first. I've got, I've got to spend some time with my family. He says, hey, you, let the dead bury the dead. You proclaim the gospel. See, there's a value here that they're not seeing. And we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. They see Jesus as something or someone who can give them something they want, but not as the Lord who deserves all honor, all glory who has all power forever and ever. Amen. See, because when our eyes are actually open to who Jesus is, it breaks our hearts. We realize that everything else was in vain before, that everything else was lost before, that nothing matters more than this. So many people in our culture are rocky soil Christians. When you till the ground on the surface layer, it's usually pretty easy. It's easy to break up that first layer of soil. Shallow Christians said a prayer or found some attractional reason to call themselves Christians, but they were unwilling to let God dig up, dig up the rocks of their soil. And because of this, they will never grow true and deep roots. Many of these, not all of them, but many are false converts who follow a version of Jesus that they have invented or some ear tickling false teacher has invented. But when the rubber meets the road, when it's time to turn over a rock or break up a hard place in their life, they're like, no, 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 this isn't what I asked for. This is not what I signed up for. 
And Jesus, listen, he only wants one thing from you. But that one thing is everything. He wants surrender. He wants your entire life. These are the same ones spoke about in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, where Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So at one point he's saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. And these are the people who will enter the kingdom of heaven. But in Matthew 7, he's saying these are the people that won't be part of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that is coming. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Cast out demons in your name? Do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The scariest words in scripture the scariest words a person will ever hear. He's not talking to people who are pagans who openly rejected God. He's talking to people who had rocky and soil, the rock in the soil of their heart, who thought that Jesus was their Lord, but they weren't really giving them in their life. These are the people who followed Jesus at a distance and said, well, maybe this guy is the son of God. Let's go have a cup of coffee and ponder it for the rest of our lives. Lord, Lord, you can call him Lord, but you got to live as if he is Lord. And if your eyes are open to this truth, you will. It's not about being a perfect Christian. It's about being a genuine Christian. It's not about having great faith. It's about having real faith, which is saving faith. Later in Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it didn't fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these, wor these words of mine, but does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. See, there's only room for one rock in your garden. And it's not the ones that you bring to Jesus. And it's not the ones that you come to Christ with in your heart. It's the one that he clears the ground out for so he can put down the chief cornerstone, the rock of ages, a firm foundation, the rock who is Christ himself and his words. There ain't room for any other rocks. The ones who didn't build on the foundation of Christ and his sacred word, when the Holy Spirit exposed the stone inside of them that needed to be removed so that their faith could take root, decided instead to dig around it rather than to break it up and to pull it out. I pastored a lot of people coming out of addiction and in recovery, there's a saying, but it's really not just for recovery. It's true for all Christians. And this is it. Leave no stone unturned. Brothers and sisters, leave no stone of sin. Leave no besetting weight. Leave no stone unturned in the garden of your heart. In Mark's account of this same parable in Mark 4, in verses 5 and 6, it says this. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. But then he adds this line. And when the sun rose, it was scorched since it had no root, it withered away. It's interesting. It's interesting here that the same sun that makes rooted and watered plants grow, that same sun makes a seed planted in a rocky place spring up and quickly die. This reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Charles Spurgeon. It's a long quote, but I'm gonna read it to you. 
I think I read it probably a few weeks ago, but it applies so well when it comes to this parable. Spurgeon once said, I believe that the gospel makes some men more miserable than they would be. The drunkard could drink and revel in his intoxication with greater joy if he did not hear it said that all drunkards will have their place in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. How jovial the Sabbath breaker could riot through his Sabbaths. If it was not written, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. How happily could the libertine and the lascivious man drive on in his mad career if it were not told that the wages of sin is death and after death, the judgment. But the truth put the bitter in his cup. The warnings of God freeze the current of his soul. The truth of the gospel and the scripture shine bright as the midday sun. And let us remember the same sun which melts the wax also hardens the clay. And the same gospel which melts some persons to repentance, hardens others in their sin. When trouble or persecution for the sake of God's word comes, they quickly fall away. When the rubber meets the road, when it's time to actually live out your faith, when your faith is actually tested, when following Jesus costs you something, the sun exposes who they are and if they're really rooted in Christ or not. If you fall away because you're unwillingly, unwilling to boldly and unashamedly stand for the gospel in every part of God's word, it's because you have no, you have no real connection to Christ. If you're willing to distance yourself from the word of God when it comes in, con in conflict with popular social issues, the things that the world is, is, is raving on about today, if you distance yourself from those or you say things like, listen, I believe in the grace of God in Ephesians chapter two, but that Romans one part, I, I don't really wanna proclaim that part. If you stay silent or if you pretend like that's not God's word, hear me. If you reject him at any part of his word, you reject him in total because Christ is the word made flesh. If you're a young Christian, I'm not saying you have to understand every part of this. I don't understand every part of this yet, but I, I, I don't reject any of it. If, if, if my flesh, if my life come in conflict with the word of God, it's not God's word that needs to change or be updated. It's me. I need to be conformed to the image of the person I'm supposedly calling Lord by his holy word. If you don't dig up the rocks and the hard places in your life, the rocks in the soil, of your garden. If you don't dig them up at some point, you will wither and you will die. On to number four, the thorny soil. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and proves, proves it unfruitful. People who are focused on temporal things rather than eternal things. The worries of life. It's the worries and anxieties of life that makes the deceitfulness of riches a temptation to us. Let me say that again. It's the worries of life. It's the, it's the, the need for things. That's why Jesus addresses this in the model prayer. He says, when you come to God, it's okay to pray for your daily bread. He knows you need those things. If you don't trust God in the basic substance of your life, then you don't trust God. That's why the deceitfulness of wealth is tempting to us. Jesus himself said, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. You'll, you'll love and serve one and be devoted to it and hate the other. You cannot serve two gods. There can only be one Lord of your life. 
If it's Jesus, it can't be you. It can't be your family. It can't be popular social issues. It can't be money. It can't be anything else. And any of the sin in your life is what you should be working to mortify and kill. Not that you won't sin, but the fact you're actively uh, addressing it because you love God, because the Spirit is convicting you and drawing you to Himself. People who are focused on temporal things more than eternal things. The worries of life make the deceitfulness of wealth tempting. We all have needs, but Jesus tells us not to worry about them because God will supply them. Matthew, 16, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 24. He says, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasure in heaven where neither moth, moth or rust can destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Hear me. He's saying, if you perceive money as your God, like if this is what you really, if you believe godliness is a means to financial gain, if you perceive light as darkness or darkness as light rather, listen, if you think what's dark is actually light because you're blind, how great is that darkness? To serve the creation, to serve the blessing, to serve your needs more than the one who provides, gives, and creates. Why do we desire to be rich? Why are we so gullible to listen to preachers who say the opposite of what God's word plainly teaches about money? We're so easily blinded by the deceitfulness of riches because like Satan, our fallen flesh wants to be in control. We want to call the shots. We want to be the king of our own life, but we can't because you can't serve two masters. That's why we desire to be rich. That desire is so deceiving because it convinces you that you can serve two masters. That's what perceiving darkness as light actually is. You're so deceived if you think that darkness is actually light. If you're a blind person who's never seen the sunrise, your description of what light is, is going to be lacking. Before you know it, your life is tangled up in all sorts of things, all sorts of thorns, all sorts of compromises that will choke out any good fruit until you end up getting what you desired all along, a life where you don't answer to God until one day you do. The deception that you can control your life, that you can control outcomes. You can either walk by faith or by sight. You can pretend like God won't judge you one day or you can live in the sight of the fact that that is truly going to happen and hide yourself in him. The thorns of stuff, bigger, better, newer. It's a cluster of thorns that will consume your life, will choke out your joy and will leave you fruitless. You can only pursue one thing. You can pursue money. You can pursue fame. You can pursue personal happiness. You can pursue your dreams. But if you pursue these things as the priority, you are not pursuing God. It's deceitful. It'll trick you. It'll trick you into thinking you can, but you can't. You've got to trust God's word. You've got to trust God with your life. You got to leave your tax collector's booth and say, I don't know where we're going, but wherever you're going, I'm going with you. And Matthew 6, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and all these things will be added to you. Don't follow things. Don't follow your own heart. Follow Jesus and he'll take care of you. He'll provide for your needs according to the richness of your, of your joy. You won't beg for bread. Listen, you might walk through the fire, but he'll be there with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Listen, the kingdom of heaven is where Jesus is. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. It's the presence of a living God. And finally, we come to number five, the good soil. Remember as Christians and preachers of the gospel, we cast seed, but we are not responsible for the kind of soil that it lands on. We have no power to change someone's heart. We have no power to change someone's heart. We don't even really have the power to know someone's heart. Sometimes their fruit can be a good indication of who they are, but we don't know, only God knows. No matter how desperately we wish we could change someone's heart. Man, there are people that I've been praying for for years, some for decades. And if I could just break the soil of their heart where this seed would find good soil, I would do it. I would give up anything to make that happen. But I don't have that power. The only power I have in that is prayer as I seek the one who can, the one who can break a hard heart, who can change the condition of someone's heart to make it receive the seed. The only soil that we are responsible for is the soil of our own hearts. Paul said, some plants, some water, but only God makes things grow. Here's a real quick rebuke to prosperity driven preachers and churches for today. This is talking about the soil of receiving God's word and the gospel. This is not about money. When it says you'll produce and, and, and have a, a yield of a hundred or 60 or 30 fold. This is talking about the gospel, how shameful it is to take something that's talking about men and women's eternities and distorting it so you can line your pockets. Shame on you. This is talking about receiving the word of the Lord and letting it take root in your life. Nothing is more wicked than, than someone who takes a text like this and distorts it and teaches something that's actually teaching the opposite of the point Jesus is making. There's nothing more wicked than that. In fact, it's satanic. So what is good soil? Any farmers in here? What, what makes soil good? What makes soil good for seed? Good soil is broken soil. It's tender, you can move it around. It's pliable, it's broken up so that when seed falls on it, it can go down deep. And when the water and the sun uh, come into contact with it, it can grow deep roots and produce what it was meant to produce. Good soil is broken soil. In my ministry, I've seen the tell of four soils play out time and time again. These are gospel truths regarding the condition of someone's heart that demonstrates one of four ways that someone will receive the word of the Lord. Will the gospel take root in your life? Has the gospel taken root in your life? How will you respond to the gospel? It's the same sun that melts the wax that also hardens the clay. And the same gospel which melts some people to re repentance hardens others in their sin. We don't need an innovation on the gospel. We don't need a change of the way we preach. We don't need some new method for Gen Z or millennials or whatever or whoever else. It's always been the word of God. It's always been the blood of Jesus. It will never lose its power. What we need is the spirit of God to do a miracle in our hearts. See, I proclaim God's word and I pray that God would do something miraculous with it. 
I've never saved anybody. I've never changed anybody. My preaching has never done anything apart from intervention of the, of, of the power of the spirit of God, which gives us ears to hear and eyes to see. If you're hearing this today and the seed is falling on hard ground, pray that God would break your heart. Pray that he would break the soil of your heart that you might receive these words and they produce something in you. Are you willing to let God break you? Are you willing to let God turn over every rock in your life, every hidden place so that he can build this place back in his very image? Will you let him tear down your life so he can build it back with something strong, something powerful, something like Jesus? Will you let him break you so that he can build you so that the seed can produce good fruit in your life so that you can have a brand new heart with a clean heart and clean hands? You can read the Bible every day. You can recite prayers 24 hours a day. But if you're unwilling to let God break you into pieces, Turn over every stone, prune every part of your life, cut away every thorny place. You'll never have deep roots and you will never bear good fruit. And maybe not today or tomorrow, but eventually what happens to all trees that don't bear fruit will happen to you. They'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. He who has ears, let him hear. Spirit of God, break us. Make us like you. I want to close with the scripture that talks about the beauty of repentance, the beauty of a broken heart before God, of good soil. Acts 3 12, it says, Repent then, turn to God, so that your sins might be wiped out, and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Refreshing comes when you lay down the heavy yoke. Refreshing comes when you let God pull the stone out of your garden, when you let him break up the hard parts, when you let him cut away the thorns that you think are so important, but are actually choking out the fruit that God wants to bear in your life. Yes, this is a gospel-centered message to those who, who are outside of Christ, but hear me, saints, hear me, lest you fall away. Anchor yourself to these words. Let God do the work of the spirit in your garden. Come to him once again and say, God, make me like you. I repent. God, help me because I can't, I can't break up this part of my life. I can't break up this dependency I have on money. I can't break up this fear and anxiety. I can't remove this place where I'm addicted to pornography or I'm filled with anger or I'm filled with lust or I'm filled with fear. And he's not asking you to do it on your own. All he wants you to do is say, it's yours. I'm sorry if I let the thorns grow up, but prune me, change me. Make me like you. And I promise you this. If you come to God with a broken, open, contrite and repentant heart, he will not resist you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your spirit. Lord, I thank you for the seed, God. Lord, I pray today this seed would fall on good ground. God, that as I do the, the, the very small work of preaching, that you would do the very important work of, of breaking hearts, of giving ears the, the, the capacity to hear, opening blind eyes, God, and producing fruit, giving new life to dead bones. God, I pray this, that, that there would be fruit from this sermon, God, to people who are here or people who are watching online. And God, that your word would not return void. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.